So if you could be here around nine, that would be great. Okay. Well, listen here. Hello, and welcome to 90 Day Fiance K. I'm Mr. O, and today, Ms. H and I will be discussing Season 8, Episodes 17 and 18 of Happily Ever After. In these episodes, Angela shows Michael how to act in America, Ashley and Manuel come to an understanding that her mother doesn't agree with, Patrick and John get to know Carlos better, Emily and Kobe come home and share some big news, Rob tries to call it on his relationship with Sophie, Alex adjusts to Lauren's announcement about working just in time for her to make another announcement, and Jasmine's beauty pageant finally comes to an end. We'll be back again next week to talk about episode 19, and we'll also be back on our other channel, Love After Lockup MK, when Love After Lockup returns later this month. All right, thanks for listening. Stay safe and enjoy. Hello, Mr. O. Hello, Ms. H. How are you today? I'm doing too bad. Not too, too bad. I'm at the beach, so that's always a good time. Oh, nice. Like, yeah. Yeah, I know you just got off the boat, which is why we're doing uh, late today, <laughs> the, the double, yeah, double time yeah, this time. Yeah, we skipped so, a week. Yeah, summer right, vacation time right. is always fun. It is. Uh, and I didn't realize you're at the beach, but that makes sense why your Wi-Fi isn't correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is why I keep cutting out. Um, so hopefully it yeah. will affect the recording. But let's talk about let's talk about other people who still started started at least the two weeks on their trip. And that's Emily and Kobe. So it's almost time to leave Cameroon. So Emily and Kobe are packing everything up uh, for four people and uh, the various suitcases. So Emily says she's going to miss Kobe's family, but also is ready to get back into their routines in the States. So Kobe says it's not easy for him to leave his home again and then back home with the parents. You know, it always cramps their style because, again, they're still living with her parents. So Emily says they need to get 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 on that finding a house thing. Kobe floats the idea of, well, you know, where we can find a house is here in Cameroon because we saved up some money and it's going to go a lot farther here. And then Emily is like barely not laughing, just being like, really? Really? That's what you want to do? He says it wouldn't be permanent just for a year or two. And it's going to help the kids be more more like well-rounded and touch with their Cameroonian ancestry and culture. So Emily's response is basically like, no, no. I'm not moving my kids to the U.S. Uh, out of the U.S. They're better off there, and he he agrees that long term they're better off in the U.S. But they're not also not going. She also thinks they're not going to learn anything again about Cameroonian culture because they're like three and one, and they won't remember being in Cameroon for a year. She has a um, point. Yeah. So Emily says in interviews, she get understands where he's coming from, but this is really not something to bring up. Um, you know, when the kids are older, she should bring it up. But um, you know, it's really more about him being homesick. And also doesn't appreciate that he's literally like, while they're packing to go, just like, maybe we should move here. <laughs> so right now the answer is no. And he kind of gets pissy and is like, so I guess you make all the re- decisions in the marriage just for everybody. So anyway, later on, it's time to leave. And Emily is checking all the drawers and making sure that any checking for anything they left behind. So Valerie is coming to the airport with them and they start loading up the car. So Kobe says it's been the fastest two weeks ever. And he's pleased with how well how, how well everything gone. Of course, he wishes he could get more time with his family and everyone here in Cameroon. But on the drive, you know, on the drive, they kind of start talking about like, well, do you think the kids are going to remember this? And then she's like, well, I don't know. Why don't you tell my parents what you told me about getting the kids to remember things? Um, to limit. <laughs> um, so they each kind of make their own cases in the car for what they what they think in the front of the car. David is just confused. He was like, where would you live? What would you do for money? And Kobe says, well, I have plenty of businesses I can do. And Emily's like, businesses like what? <laughs> so parents also solidly against the idea of moving to Cameroon since things are just going fine in the U.S. So in the car, David gets straight to the point and he's like, well, if you left Cameroon for a better life for yourself, why would you want the kids to live there? (laughs) But he Kobe doesn't agree with the premise. He says he left to get skills that he and his his plan was always to ultimately come back to Cameroon like um, and, you know, get paid when he's there. So Emily's mom decides that maybe they should just table this discussion and not have it on the way to the airport. So she's not (laughs) saying no, that they shouldn't definitely move, but that needs to be an in-depth conversation. So they arrive at the airport with their 11 suitcases and Kobe says uh, goodbye to Valerie and they're on their way. And then the second episode, we see them again in Kansas driving the kids to what they're calling like a mystery surprise. We're driving you to the mystery thing, surprise thing. And when we get where they're going, we learn that it's a prenatal clinic because Emily is pregnant again with kid number three. Oh, God. 
So oh she's getting an ultrasound, and then that is like how they're telling the kids, which is kind of weird because they definitely don't get it. They're like, "What's that on the screen?" They're like, "I don't know, like googly shapes. It's not anything." <laughs> um, Coben eventually gets it, and they also just uh, and also assumes it's a girl, like just because last time it was a girl, I think. Uh, so we were told that they were kind of, kind of trying, not like really trying, but just like you know they pulled the goalie and we're like, "We'll see what happens." So even though oh, they God. promised her parents uh, that they wouldn't have a third kid until they had their own place. So now the pressure is on to really find a new place before this kid is born. So next up, it's time to tell her parents. So they were hoping to tell them after they had got a house, but he said there's not much on the market and Emily's only going to be getting more pregnant. So they got to break the news before it's just like, um, I think I know what's going on here. So anyway, um, they're both very nervous to tell the parents. And then we jump to their dinner, which is just a security charcuterie board on a, in the, on the porch and they tell mom and dad, they're like, first start talking about the house search. And then Lisa's like, well, you know, wh- when do you see them moving out? When do you think you might move out? And the kids are just like, there's a baby in mommy's tummy. Oh, so, cool. so they try to ignore <laughs> But as they were, they were trying to work up to it. And then Kobe tells them that Emily's pregnant. David says he has no clue. And that might be a little more urgency to get them out of the house. But maybe perhaps they've been too enabling. And they're definitely kicking out around the idea of like, okay, when when is it appropriate to kick them out? They need to go. So I guess I guess that's the question is when do you think it's appropriate to kick them out? Uh, I mean, didn't they make okay, what I thought was really funny is they said we promised our parents we wouldn't get pregnant with a third kid. It's like, I'm pretty sure you promised about the second kid. So really, parents probably should have, you know, waited for the second Scarlet to be born and then probably given them some amount of time then. Because I completely understand from their perspective, like a family is taking over their house. Right. Yeah. Like there's there's. There was already they were already outnumbered, right? As soon as they had the first kid, they were outnumbered. Now they have two kids and three kids, and never outnumbered just by kids. And you're and especially like, and especially when like they had what they Emily's their only child, right? So they were like, yeah. we uh, managed no, to get. She had a sister because remember the oh. sister was living with them like when we first saw, and there might have also been a COVID situation, but. Mm. Uh, the sister clearly doesn't live there, which is how I think the kids even have a room, you know, or at least one of the kids have a room. But, you know, it's it's they already said don't get pregnant again. And they and so Lisa was right. They are at this point enabling them because they're yeah. not actually kicking them out. Right. When they said yeah, that's the rule we had set and you violated it. And so. Right. Yeah, and it'd be like, well, then you guys need to have a place before this baby's born. Like we told you no more kids in this house because it is because yeah. it, it's not like it, it it isn't, especially when in the way they said it, it wasn't like some sort of freak accident. My birth control failed. Like we were on birth control. Right. It did not work. Yeah. It was like, no, no, no. We were, you know, not trying, trying, but we definitely weren't using birth control anymore. And it's like, well, then no, like, then that is a violation. Yeah, that's kind of trying in yeah. a very passive, but not really passive way. Yeah, I mean, there is the, there is that kind of idea that people like have like no trying means you're going to the fertility clinics and doing all kinds of stuff like that. Whereas just like this was just a maybe if we would welcome it if it happened, which is a fine stance to take. I'm not against that at all, but mm-hmm. it is a not an acceptable thing to do when you've kind of have this deal where part of the deal of living where you're living is that you don't have any more kids. And you're like, we decided to halfway try. And it's like, well, then you. That is a broken promise. Right. And I was going to say, we these are known fertile people. I mean, they got pregnant oh, yeah, within sure. very quickly of dating. And then as soon as Kobe got to the U.S., they were pregnant pretty immediately then. So it's like these people like do not take much to, you know, oh, be yeah. pregnant. And so knowing that there really is no, oh, we weren't really trying. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, 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 as somebody who he was blessed enough to have like very good luck when I, with my two children. Yeah, I would mm-hmm. not like, I'm like, no, if I, if we're, if, if people are off birth control one month, it, it's definitely happening. Like that is not, <laughs> right. that, that would be my plan. Like this is like the contingency. I was like, I would be surprised if it didn't happen more than if it did. So yes, this right. is, that's as far as he is, that that's just trying. Yeah. I, I just feel bad for her parents. And I mean, like, yeah, kind of spoiler alert. I mean, I think it's come out that they do have a house now, but yes. we don't know at what point in this pregnancy or, 
even if it was in the pregnancy, that it actually happened. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But they need that HEA money to have a down payment. I think that's what they were kind of waiting on, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe. They said they had like a down payment. And I think it's going to come out. It seemed like in the, the previews for next week, it's very much like – the houses were available, just not good enough for Emily. And the mom's like, well, you better lower your standards then because you right. need to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, because Emily was kind of saying, she's like, there's no houses. And that I can certainly relate to as being someone who's trying to find a place right now. And it feels like there are no reasonably priced houses that you're looking That's for. That's the biggest thing. Right. I'm, I'm in a similar boat. And it's not that... It's not that there's nothing out there that I can afford. It's just that what's out there that I can afford. I'm like, this is not, not as big as I it want. should be. This is not worth yeah. this money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Exactly. All right. Uh, let's move on to another couple uh, that maybe has some money problems. And that's uh, Ashley and Manuel. So Manuel and Ashley have just had their big blowout fight over money. Oh, and by the way, this was two episodes ago because we're covering two episodes today. Uh, Manuel comes back in the room and tries to get in the bed to sleep with Ashley. He wants to clear things up because he doesn't like the conflict. He tells her when they were in New York, he did not send any money to anyone. Manuel does admit to talking to his ex, but just to get updates on the kids. He doesn't always want to tell her the truth just because Ashley, she takes things the wrong way. And it's just easier for him to keep it from her than to upset her. He apologizes. He also tells her that. He took the $1,000, which was in question in the argument before, and put it in the bank just to save. He feels powerless that he can't work and he really wants a better life for them. And it sounds like he's taking it into his own hands because he doesn't trust her with money. The additional $300 was for his mom because there's something wrong with her arm. Ashley says that he can ask for money, but she wants to know what it's for because when she doesn't know, she imagines the worst. Manuel sheds a couple of tears and tells her it's difficult for him to talk about money and he doesn't want to share his sadness because he doesn't want her to feel sad as well. Ashley is very happy that he's opening up and apologizing. Manuel says that he just wants to return to Ecuador so he can see his loved ones. He misses his family and kids so much and he cries. He's not there for them, which hurts him the most. Ashley says that they're all family now and she'll help as much as she can, but she does want to know what's going on. Moving forward, Manuel wants to earn her trust, love and respect. He says that he'll work on the opening up. In the next episode, Ashley and Manuel are going to celebrate Manuel's birthday. If you recall from a couple episodes ago, Ashley was buying a birthday cake and wanted to put fuck you or something Mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. Uh, And they're celebrating with Ashley's family. They're going to a whiskey distillery. They're greeted by family, which includes Stacy, Ashley's mom, and Jasmine, her cousin, and Sienna, her sister. They cut the cake and enjoy some whiskey tasting. Sienna, her sister, is confused that they made up so quickly because if you recall, Sienna's the one who went to get the cake with her and was like, whoa, fuck you on the cake. And she spills the tea to the rest of the family about their money issues, including the $1,000 where she doesn't know where it went. Stacy, her mom, thinks that Manuel is shady and a liar. Stacy thinks that Ashley is smart. Okay, Stacy. But mm. obviously not as smart enough to see what's happening here. The family continues to gossip about the situation when Ashley and Manuel finally join them. Manuel greets Stacy and immediately she gives him the stink eye. Ashley then steps in and has to defend Manuel. Ashley is pissed that, as she puts it, her honey is getting attacked. She asks him for the password to the bank account so she can see the $1,000 that is, you know, as Manuel says, is in the bank after her family is kind of like arguing and pushing her towards like, you know, we need to know the truth. Mm -hmm. Manuel slurs, clearly drunk from whiskey, Mm. and says that since they're married, it's their money. They continue to attack Manuel as Ashley massages her third eye. (laughs) Oh, God. How is that going to help anything in this situation? Third Eye can't make money mm-hmm. or generate passwords. I, I so. don't know what Third Eye is supposed to do at all. That is like something I I've heard know. of that I don't know what it's supposed to mean at all. <laughs> I don't know how massaging an eye is going to do anything anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah, generally eyes are not massage. Correct. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. 
so uh, do you think that Manuel really is telling the truth about like kind of squirreling this one thousand dollars or do you think that he really is a liar and is doing something else with this money? Oh, I, I totally believe he needs to squirrel away money whenever he can. Like, yeah. And I think he's probably thought that he's probably done that his whole life. And that's just a natural like thing for him to do is to be like, if you come across any money or come across the opportunity to get any money, take it, put it away. Like it's like literally a squirrel, right? Um, and took it squirrel yeah. away. So I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. But it didn't he – but he said – but that said – He's not consistent about what he's saying he's doing with this money, which makes – that right. makes it more into liar territory, right? But did your mom hurt yeah. her arm? I thought you said your mom hurt her arm. And he's like, yeah, but I put it in the bank. I'm not sure which one he's getting at. All I know is he cried and so that meant he was serious and Ashley <laughs> bought that. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay. So, she – uh, he asked for the thousand dollars and then Ashley didn't know where that money was. She just thought it was for the family. And then uh -huh. he immediately asked her for more money. And she's like, I just gave you a thousand dollars. And so I think the additional money was for his mom because he didn't want to dip into his own little savings. The thing that I find kind of shady about that whole thing is I get what he's doing. He's trying to mm -hmm. save Ashley from herself. Yes. Right? Like, sure. right. okay, let's, you know, save this money. But it doesn't look all that different from that random typically like stereotypically housewife who's trying to save money so in case of a divorce they have a little nest egg well yeah i mean which but the thing is i feel like a lot of people kind of you sympathize with that with that one who uh, just in case something goes wrong he, he she has something mm -hmm. to rely on like i think a lot of people like that's smart that's thinking that's not like people don't think of her, you're a dirty liar who, you know, is the worst right. person ever. But I, I, I'm with you. It sounds like if he really is squirreling away this money, it's because he's like, wow, Ashley just came into $2,000. I should ask for a thousand of it so that she only spends a thousand of it and doesn't spend all 2000 because if she, like, right. she keeps all the money, she will spend all the money <laughs> on stuff. Yes. We don't need. Yes. He is trying to save her from herself. And I understand that he has to change the password because, you know, she realizes, Oh, it's just sitting in her account that she will spend it. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, this non-transparency just seems like it can fall apart very easily. Yes. Yes. It, there's there's no way it works because there's no way you can be uh, – I, I just don't know a way to actually have a successful relationship and marriage with someone who whose spending habits you don't trust. Right. right? And if you're like if – you, if you literally like, – there's no way for him to honestly and openly with transparency – withhold money from her so she doesn't spend it because she fundamentally disagrees that she shouldn't spend the money. Right. It's not like so, she, yeah, you know, but I mean, and they have that fight. It's because it's not like she's like, oh man, yeah, I just give in to impulses and it would be nice if somebody could restrain me or, or, you know, do that. And so I wouldn't waste this money. She's legitimately telling him I'm not wasting money. I don't waste money. Why are you saying I waste money? Right? right. They just don't agree on that. And so if she sees the money in his account, she's going to take it and spend it because she doesn't see it as a waste. Yeah. I mean, it's just really difficult. I think this situation is really difficult because how do you save someone from themselves when they're kind of the keeper or the earner of the money? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the other thing that bothered me, too, is like it was very much not her friends and moms. Like that's definitely – not in their lane, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it definitely is, oh, I heard some things about going on with the money. And if Ashley would have been like, yeah, but we had to talk about it and we got it all straightened out and figured it out. That should be the yeah. end of the conversation, right? right? That shouldn't be, well, I think he's a liar. How dare you trust this liar? Like, wh no. Why are you doing that? Like, that's that's crazy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It is pretty crazy. All right. So, since we're talking about crazy, let's just keep it on crazy. <laughs> yeah. And that means Angela. So Oh, gosh. Um, so we, we're back in the U.S. right now, and, and this is again two episodes ago. And Angela is sneaking into the house where it looks like Skyla is helping the grandba grandbabies with homework or something. It's always grandbabies around. Right. So Angela surprises them, and they all give her lots of hugs. They don't know that Michael is here, or that it, it, so he's just waiting in the car. So we get a lot of awkward shots of Mike, Michael just sitting in a dark car with his like USA <laughs> jacket on. Um, <laughs> They even wake up the kids and she comes in. They wake up one of the kids that was already in bed. Um, and she wants, she wants Michael's 
you know, arrival to be a surprise. So she's really excited to see, especially the look on Skyla's face, because Skyla said this day would never come. So Angela sits down at the table and says, she'll wait forever for this visa. And, you know, she asks like the grandbabies, who said Michael doesn't come? And Skyla is just surprised that, um, like she, like, she, he, she said Michael was really upset he didn't get the visa and she and Skyla's just like was he because he's always lying to you and like or he, you know and it, it's a, a whole thing like, and so she's really surprised that Angela still even wants him here after all the updates she's been getting when they were in Ivory Coast so anyway um, Angela says we well, yeah, she knows he's crazy but ultimately he she found out and she decided he didn't do the things that she initially thought he was doing and um you know, and so th- everything's fine. So she's really milking the surprise. And we switch to Michael, who's, again, just sitting in the car waiting for – I guess it was a time. I guess she said wait 10 minutes and come in or something. Yeah. Um, and so she doesn't – she doesn't think that Scott is going to be happy that he that he's here. He doesn't at least. So he's pretty nervous. So after the time, he gets up, knocks on the door, and the grandbabies open the door and scream in surprise because, of course, it's Michael. And everyone laughs and smiles and screams and hugs, and the grandbabies are doing all of it. And Skyla's even smiling, hugs all the grandbabies, hugs Skyla, and says they all look so grown up, you know, all that kind of stuff, you city kids. So um, it, it has been. He's known these kids, like, on the internet for, like, 10 years yeah. or something now. Like, yeah. Yeah. So he also comes in with gifts since it's Christmas time. There's slippers and there's a purse for Skyla. And Skyla just thinks he's acting good right now because, you know, he's on his best behavior, wants everybody to be in a good mood. She doesn't want to like shit on everybody's good mood. So she's putting on a good face. And then uh, Michael gets a grand tour of the house, which is very different from his house because, you know, he doesn't have things like a laundry dryer or two refrigerators or light switches everywhere. He's like, oh, my God, you have so many light switches. Um, anyway, so – or most importantly to him, air conditioning. So he knows it's, you know, going to be time for him to gear up to be, I guess he's going to be the house husband is the plan that he's promised yeah. to be for so long. So they finally get to the bedroom, which is a disaster area. There is just stuff <laughs> everywhere. Huge cluttered mess, clothes all over the floor, stuffed animals on the bed, hats and purses hanging everywhere. And Michael is just overwhelmed by what clutter it is. And so much so, he's like, where's my stuff going to go? Where am I going to go? So, the second episode, we have uh, a little bit of an issue with that, too, because she takes Michael for a drive in the U.S., which means getting into her very small, like, two-seater Pontiac. (laughs) He's like, I don't fit in your car, Angela. We need a new car. So, Michael's nervous about the drive because he's never been driven anywhere by by Angela, let alone any other woman. It's very, you know, kind of a sexist driving culture over there. Um So they stop and like they get some like, I guess they're like hot Doritos and stuff and stop at a gas station. And and then she's like, well, you better not fart when you eat these. I don't – and then we talk about his farts for a while, which we don't need to get into. No. So the next up, we're hanging Christmas lights in the house, which means that Michael's up like on the ladder. He says that Nigeria, Christmas trees are quite common, but not these outside decorations. So this is new to him. So she gets cold and leaves him out with the grandbabies who ask him, oh, he's liking America and also – go full in on making fun of his ashy feet, like just all yeah. out there. So he doesn't say anything, but is not really happy about having to cope with these disrespectful kids. So later on, they go to dinner with Skyla and they, they get there and they meet the host. Who, I guess Angela like knows the owner, knows the host, they're friends. And they sit down at the booth where Skyla is already sitting. So Skyla says she thinks this relation he's in this relationship for the wrong reasons, and she really would like to them to break up before things get too far. I was like, I don't know what too far means. They're married, and he's here. Right. right. Um, yeah. Michael's confused by the, like the items on the menu. He's very confused about chicken fingers. He's like, chickens don't have fingers. That's not a. What do you mean chicken fingers? But ends up getting shrimp and grits like Angela wants. So the food comes, and then Michael like. He's like a cat. Like, he smells it for a long time and then, like, touches it with his tongue, like, licking it before he puts it in his mouth. So, he he tells Angela that he thinks it's okay. But back in the interview, he's like, no, this food is nothing. Like, I want my food back home. So, he takes a, also takes a bite of one of her ribs and kind of, like, has a little bit of gristle in his mouth that he kind of, like, like does that and, like, shoots out of his mouth. And that just sends Angela over the edge. She's like, why are you spitting on the wall of my friend's establishment? Um, then she's like, you know what you just did? And then, like, spits her food on Michael. Like, and, <laughs> and then gets up and, and she gets up in embarrassment. So now Angela's outside, angry smoking and uh, just mad that Michael not just, you know, kind of spit this food out. 
in her friend's place, but also that he said he didn't do it. So eventually she comes back in and they apologize to each other. Now, Michael kind of doesn't deny that he did kind of like, you know, spit the food out of his mouth, but it was like, it wasn't spit. I didn't spit anywhere. It wasn't my spit. It was just a piece of gristle or whatever. Or he says a piece of particle. Um, so anyway, they apologize to each other. Then it's time to get to Skyla. Skyla, as she gives her disapproval. So she thinks that Michael is just on like best behavior mode now. It's only a matter of time before the real Michael comes out. So Skyla warns him that she's much less forgiving and not as nice as Angela. Oh, my God. Not as nice as Angela. Oof. Oh, God. <laughs> so Michael says that he just wants everyone to be happy and for this to work out. But Skyla is skeptical that that could be an option. So Angela insists that Michael isn't get away, get, get, get away with everything from the past, but she's kind of starting. It's a fresh start, new beginning type thing. So I guess between, you know, Angela going crazy and Skyla being here judge, judging him all the time and the grandbabies being like ridiculously disrespectful and rude. Like, oh, my God, going to get to him first. Yeah, he is not going to like life. Right. Um Everyone who has come from a warm weather country and has to move to America when there's a winter, that is first of all, like the thing they're like, I don't like it. You know, it was funny that he was like, it has indoor AC and it's like, "Mm, does it even matter in the middle? (laughs) It's like days before Christmas. But um, I just... I can see, like, we all know, right, where this ends up. I can already see all of this playing out because it is playing out right now. Just Mm -hmm. the way that Angela, like, flipped out on him, like, at the restaurant with the whole spinning thing. Like, I know exactly what he's doing. Sometimes you get a little something like, you know, it's just like a speck of something and you just kind of like, I don't know, projectile blow it out of your mouth. Yes, right? uh, that's exactly what it was. spitting sure. on anything. Right. And she No, but you flips. should probably still do that into a napkin and not into, oh, yeah, <laughs> into absolutely. the air. Like, like. Right, right. I get it. But, you know, she made it out into be this huge deal. And the way that she talks to him, you know, and flies off the handle, doesn't have any kind of communication with him. And it's just like, he's just walking around like a scared kid all the time. She doesn't even talk to her grandbabies that way. No, no, it's it's definitely a a unhinged mother type yelling, right? And it's right. Because like he had a tiny little bit of stuff that you're right, it should, blew out of his mouth, should have done it into a napkin. That would have been the polite thing to do. Um, mm-hmm. But then she's like, you're such a disgusting person. You know what you did? And then she takes a huge chunk of food and just puts it in her mouth and spits it back on him and lets it <laughs> right. fall on the floor. It's like, okay, but you just yelled at him for that. This is what you did. And it's like, that was worse. What you just did was worse than what he did. Right. Like, yeah. And yeah, it's just it, it it just goes to show that she has like zero respect for this guy at all. Oh, right. Right. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that there are allegations of abuse because mm-hmm. it's like we already see that it's totally believable based on what we see. And you you would think that if cameras are there, that that is your best behavior, right? That is your best yeah, foot yeah. forward. This is your best foot forward. Sure. Like that's scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I can certainly like... see how things are escalating. What right. I didn't understand in this whole segment is why Angela was insisting on trying to say "I told you so" to Skyla. <laughs> Skyla was like, "Oh, whatever." Like, you know, Skyla was not digging in and being stubborn about like. Well, you know, like, I told you so. She wasn't doing any of that. She was just like, well, I don't think Michael's going to get his visa. Right. And so, yeah. OK, you're like trying real hard to prove Skylar wrong. It's like, what's the point in that? Which is funny because Skylar's ultimate point was Michael's a scammer and a liar who's just trying to use you to get the U.S. We yeah. haven't passed. I told you so yet. <laughs> like, that could still very right. well be the case right now. Yeah. Oh, you like, got to America. OK, you must be wrong. It's like, no, she's not. I don't know. She's not. You can't say she's wrong at this point. So I just didn't understand. And I feel like a lot of what Skyla says is just kind of mirroring what Angela tells her. Yeah. Right. And so it's like. You're telling yourself so. You're the one who's saying he's a liar and a scammer every two seconds, yelling it to his face, and you're trying to prove yourself wrong? Like, it's just, yeah. it's confusing. Yeah. 
It is confusing because she always is like, like I'm sure, like if I heard the, the phone calls between her and Skyla, and we do see some of them that we that are made of a TV show, it's always, he's terrible. I'm leaving him. He was never in love with me. He never wanted to do this. He's a scammer. And it's like, okay, fantastic. Then why don't you come on home? And then like three minutes later, it's like, no, he made up. It's fine. Why would you, why yeah. would you tell me he's a scammer? Why would you want to bring that bad? <laughs> because that's what you just told me like last week. Right. <laughs> like, it makes no damn sense. But I don't know. We could go on trying to figure out what Angela is really trying to say or do, but she has no real logic. She's just no. She's all a pure emotion. emotion. Yeah, it's all emotional. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on to another family affair, and that's uh, with Patrick and Thais and company. Oh. <laughs> so everyone is piling in the car for their mini vacation to Lake Janu- Jana Uba. Uh, Patrick is in the front seat with Thais's dad, Carlos, and Thais is in the back with Patrick's brother, John. John doesn't understand everything that's being said, but his ears do seem to perk up when he hears the word piranhas. Carlos then asks why John doesn't know any Portuguese. Thais says he does know some words like slut, and he, she knows that because he called her friends that. Thais thinks that John should apologize for fighting with the girls and causing problems. But John doesn't think an apology is necessary because they started it. Three hours later, they've made it to the house. John claims he's there to help get the blessing. John and Carlos are sitting out on the patio in the morning drinking coconut drinks and seeming to communicate and have a good time, even though neither of them really understand a single word that's being said. John seems to get along with Carlos, much to Thais and Patrick's surprise. Carlos respects John for trying to get to know him and thinks that Patrick should put in more effort, like his brother. Thais struggles, uh, so later they're like at the lake and Thais struggles to cross a floating dock onto this raft. And it ends up that Thais is super scared of water, even in a pool, like irrationally scared of water. Yeah, like she thinks that she's, even if she's in the shallow end, that she's going to somehow drift off to the deep end just by standing there. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So she hands the dog to Patrick as she practically crawls to the raft. As soon as everyone is on the raft, Carlos plays around with John, threatening to push him over. Patrick tests the limits of a hammock as Carlos just scowls at him. He's just scowling the entire time. John offers to get them uh, beers as he leaves Patrick and Thais in awkward silence with Carlos. Patrick tries to start a conversation with Carlos about hobbies, and Carlos seems to like nothing. Hmm. Patrick finally tries to get out of the hammock, and Thais offers her help, but Patrick refuses and still struggling to stand back up. John comes back with a beer, and Carlos leaves the raft to drink the beer with John. Thais and Patrick are both confused, and it feels like John and Carlos are trying to exclude Patrick. Carlos starts opening up to John, and John is like, I have no idea what you're saying, so he gets out the translator app to understand. John tells Carlos that sometimes it's hard for Patrick to open up to people, and John points out that Patrick is a family man. Just look at him down there with, you know, your granddaughter and daughter. Patrick calls up to them to ask them if they want to go for their swim. At first, they just ignore him. John continues to talk up Patrick, and Carlos says that, I guess he should try to get to know Patrick in the short time that he has. Carlos goes back to the raft and dives in. Patrick is hesitant, but finally jumps in, and they both high-five in the water. And Carlos says that Patrick can earn his respect if he comes to him and puts in effort, too. Later, John and Carlos are drinking beers again, waiting for Patrick and Thais to show up to this restaurant. Patrick invites Carlos to play a game of pool. Thais is noting that things seem to be a little less tense. She's a little worried that Carlos scares Patrick, so she thinks he might not ask for the blessing. John excuses himself, and then Thais also goes to put Elise to bed, leaving Patrick and Carlos to finish their game. Patrick tells Carlos that he wants to have a good relationship with him, and Carlos says that he needs to talk to him, and he's been waiting for that to happen. Patrick says it's been difficult, and then he gives him a laundry list of excuses of why he hasn't like had a one-on-one conversation with him during this trip. He tells Carlos that he felt rejected when he didn't give his blessing the first time, which was a couple years ago at this point. Carlos says that he was hurt and didn't think Patrick showed any humility when asking. Patrick tells him that he didn't want to hurt him. Carlos admits that Patrick is taking care of Thais. 
Patrick finally asks for the blessing and Carlos starts crying, saying that he was waiting for this. He apologizes for mistreating Patrick in the past. Carlos feels close to Patrick and really happy, and they both feel so much better. The next day, Carlos actually ended up going home off camera because he's not feeling well. Patrick is just relieved he got the blessing. John, Thais, Patrick, and Elise go for a boat ride. After, Thais and Patrick are talking about party plans when John comes to join them, and Patrick excuses himself to check on a sleeping Elise. John tells Thais that he really likes Carlos. Thais is, on the other hand, struggling to find a way to bond with John. Thais thinks that John should apologize for how he talked to her friends, even though both of them were wrong. But John, he just needs to respect women. Thais uh, thanks John for helping with the blessing, but also says that he's causing problems with her friends. John asks what he should apologize for since her friends were the one who called him a bad influence and threw a drink on him, and he just assumes that they heard that he was a bad influence from Thais. And they agree that they haven't really liked each other. They're like oil and vinegar, and Thais seems confused by this reference. Thais is worried that John might say something offensive at Elise's party. John says that he loves Elise and Patrick, so he'll be on his best behavior. Thais thinks things may be getting better with communication with John. All right. So, I mean, mostly happy times here. But do you think that John owes uh, anyone an apology for his behavior with uh, Thais's friends? Because she did reference it two times and John is like, absolutely, hell no. I mean, probably. I mean, they, I believe that they owe him a, an apology as well because they came out of mm -hmm. nowhere with nothing. But she did absolutely nothing to just be randomly called a slut for no reason. Like if he right. had, had better words and was able to tell her <laughs> off in a way that wasn't just like questioning her sexual purity, then yeah, probably he wouldn't, he wouldn't <laughs> sure. have owed an apology. But right. he probably does for using that specific word. But uh, I mean, it does. It is kind of like, yeah, that, that friend came at him really hard for basically no yeah. reason yeah that's um, yeah tough yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just like if she would have been more chill that he got along with john i mean i thought it was hilarious how well john and carlos were getting along because like yeah i feel like carlos is just like this dude always be trying to like talk to me and stuff and like like john is jo john john was just like giving him beers and pineapple uh, coconut drinks or whatever just doing like the king of the hill thing just stand together and be like yep yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> like, and he's yeah. like yes that's how men talk that's where we go like it's all men come men, a lot of men relationships and men conversations are mostly vibes like uh right you know, yeah you know and it. i definitely <laughs> got that i can understand like, why carlos like gravitated more towards john than patrick right because you know, he understood Cervais or whatever their beer word yes. is, right? And so it's just like, oh, you want a beer? Yes. And it, it did like seem like John was trying way harder than Patrick to right. really just be near him. And that's what, and Carlos noticed that. And mm -hmm. I think he appreciates that effort. And just Patrick is so, you could just tell though from Patrick's point of view that he's just scared of Carlos, yeah. right? I mean, and it definitely what did. does it John can... have to be scared of? That's no yeah. one to him. I mean, it certainly came across as it was just, it was just, oh, I appreciate man to man the way that, yeah. that John was approaching me, right? Because Patrick was like, oh, well, I don't know, you want to like, you know, go water, go like water skiing or something, or may, may, maybe we could have a, a beer or something. And John was just like, hey, my man, Carlos, got your beer. Come on up here. Let's go. Right. Like, yeah. That's the kind of, that's what he wanted, like once from people. He doesn't want the little sheepish, I'm scared of you. Maybe I'll ask a thing to, instead of just being like, I've already made decisions. Let's go. I feel go. dejected. Yeah. Right, right. Right. Whereas John is just like, I've already made a decision about what's going to happen. And let's, let's, let's do that. With or without yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Come up for a beer. You don't want to? Uh, I'll sit here and drink it alone then. Peace. Yeah. Like, and it, and that's, that's the kind of energy that he was looking for more. And then, then that it, it, at the end of a day when like, you know, he finally did ask for the blessing or whatever they're playing pool, like that's a, a little closer to the energy that Patrick was bringing. Like, Hey, I want to have yeah. a talk with you. Right. Like not, not right. just like, well, please. I mean, I mean, it was, it was pretty rough though with the, you want to, uh, you know, ha, 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 go fishing. I don't like he's like no no you know, water <laughs> he's skiing? like i don't like also, no. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't. he's like but then like, it was funny too because he was like i thought you liked water skiing he's like usually i do but right now no no <laughs> I, I don't want to do anything with you <laughs> i don't want to do anything with you made him yeah. jump off that 
appear with his broken ass leg. <laughs> right. Right. That, that exactly. one, that's one of over. <laughs> All right. Is he about trying to win people over? Let's talk about Lauren and Alexi. So well, at the first episode, we're still at the dinner where Lauren dropped the bomb that she wants to go back to work. So she thinks that the struggles now with her surgery and with getting a new job are, of course, going to be hard for her and the family and Alex and everybody else. But at the end of the day, it's going to make everybody, everybody, the whole family stronger. So Alex really has been taken by surprise here. So he wants her to be happy, but he also feels like this is her just asking even more out of him at a time when he feels like he's breaking under the strain of holding things up. So – you know, and, 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 and to break – and she's also springing this on like right when he's about to get back to normal, right? When I can like be relieved of some of this burden. It's like, oh, yeah, wait. Here's more stuff. So, Lauren insists that she could have her career and also maintain their family. And Alex hopes so because doing two things like she wants to do, that's not important to him at all. It's more important that the home be taken care of by Lauren. So, he thinks she should be – and then she kind of says something about like, well, you know, I thought you would be my cheerleader. And he's just like, what? No. And then he <laughs> even brings in masculinity. He's like, no man that respects his manhood is going to sit there Aww. and be like, I'm my wife's cheerleader. Like, he's like, no, that is no. It's And then he kind of goes, usually it's the other way around. You know, the wife is the man's cheerleader. So Lauren doesn't get it. She thinks he's sounding very old fashioned with this. Men are like this. Women are like that kind of thing. And, you know, also maybe a little misogynistic. So she thinks a cheerleader is just a positive term for either partner. It's good for either person to be a cheerleader. Um, but he, but also he feels like she, he's kind of already been a cheerleader for her being a stay at home mom. Like I've been a cheerleader for that. <laughs> um, and, and it's just, just this like too, everything coming at him too fast is what is what's getting him. So he thinks it's going to be a major problem if they don't see eye to eye on the direction the family's going to go. So we see them the next day. After their date and they're having some coffee and, of course, going over the conversation they had last night. Alex has had some time to cool off and thinks he might have overreacted a little bit. And, mm -hmm. you know, he kind of wants to understand where she, where he was coming from, why he overreacted. He said he freaked out because of the timing just isn't right. And if she would have come to him at a normal time, he'd have been more supportive. But for her to bring this up right when she's, you know, finishing up this recovery, um, after he's been holding down the fort, it kind of gave him a very emotional reaction. So Lauren admits that it probably was the wrong place at the wrong time for that conversation. And Alex says he wants to support Lee, uh, Lauren, but, you know, she and she deserves to go after her goals. But he's worried uh, that this is kind of her becoming a, maybe a different person, drifting away from him a little bit. So she tells him that she it, that she appreciates the support he's given her throughout the pre all of her pregnancies and the surgery. And um, says, of course, that she that, of course, she just doesn't want to sit around the house. He understands that, of course, she doesn't want to sit around, quote unquote, sit around the house. And he'll support her doing more. But, you know, that's a whole other thing. That So that's a whole other thing that's just blown over now. So in episode number two, Lauren's parents are coming over for dinner. And it's to celebrate the official end of her recovery period after the surgery. Or what Lauren Court calls the beginning of the Lauren 2.0 era. So she tells <laughs> her parents that Dr. Dev uh, has cleared her to be able to lift the kids and do all that kind of stuff. And she's also clear to start working out, albeit slowly. So Alex and mom think that, you know, taking care of the kids is – that's an exercise enough. We don't have to push it too far. And um, her mom says that she's proud of her even if she doesn't agree with what she did, you know, as long as you don't do it again. And that's when it brings up that she's thinking of doing it again because like, her, she's like, you know, the fat – transfer she knew she was going to lose some of it and her boobs aren't as big as she thought they were so she wants to do another fat transfer maybe like a year from now um and everyone is just kind of like what no don't don't do that don't that's bad don't do that again um and she they're kind of hoping she's in the just talking things out stage it isn't going to go through with it but i don't know maybe she seems pretty serious about it so her dad warned her this kind of surgery thing can get addicting which alex seems to agree with and he also kind of Starts to make us think it's his job to to make her think that his, her body is is good enough. So I guess it's like that. Do you think there's anything she has this body dysmorphia she keeps talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's anything Alex could have done to like make her feel better about her body to the point where she wouldn't want to keep doing surgeries? 
I don't know. I think it's weird that this is the first we're hearing about her body dysmorphia, like as debilitating as she claims it is, right? Right, because, because we've heard about her Tourette's and everything else. She right. talked about her IBS today. Yeah, well, right. Yeah, because her dad, like to me, it is an extreme like situation when you can't even look in a mirror. Like he said something about how like when, you know, which I'm assuming is pre-marriage that she just didn't like having mirrors around because she had this body dysmorphia. And it seems to me, and I think, I don't know, I don't have it, so I can't really relate, but it seems to me that the better option would be to treat the underlying cause instead of the surface, right? Because you can change the surface all you want, and if you still see it differently, it's not going to make a difference how many surgeries you have. seems to me that you should probably address the body dysmorphia part. Instead of the body, right? And so go see a psychologist and talk it out, you know, and try to figure out if there's any way that you can manage this type of mental, uh, you know, illness that you can be okay with yourself as it is rather than because if it really is, if the body dysmorphia really is as bad as she says, it doesn't matter how many surgeries you no. have. If you mm-hmm. have the most perfect body, it's not going to make a difference. So it just seems like such a waste of money, a waste of, you know, everybody else having to help you with everything. It just seems like a futile, futile attempt at kind of managing the symptoms of an underlying disease. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And that's and, and I kind of get that's where Alex also you can tell has a hard time relating to it because mm-hmm. he also he's like yeah every single person in the history of the world looks in a mirror and sees things they don't like everyone right. there's sure. zero people who look in a mirror and say yeah. there is nothing I don't like about this this is perfection right. right everybody and yeah and so he's like so I guess he's kind of like I don't understand how that's a disease that's literally everybody everybody mm-hmm. looks in the mirror and has things they don't like everybody has to get over that and be like learn to be okay with the things they don't like and right and 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 no and i i don't i agree that that's but that's like saying you know like any kind of addiction or anything like that right everybody has cravings what do you mean you can't control them right that's it's Mm -hmm. it's because you don't have that condition then it's really hard to get in the mindset and understand what's going on with somebody who does but it does seem like to me, if you saw a therapist and they were like, I have body dysmorphia, do you think the surgery will fix it? The therapist would be like, absolutely no, it will not. Right. You will still yeah. have body dysmorphia after you have your surgery. You can have as yeah. many surgeries as you want. You will still feel bad about yourself. That's not going to solve it. Right? Yeah. So, I just – I think if to. that's the real reason that, you know, she wants to be getting these surgeries, that maybe she should reassess. Because right. it – if she's going to be doing this every year, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Like, you have three months of recovery for every – so, you spend nine months actually kind of in okay health and then three months out of the year, you're just putting yourself through this. It just doesn't make yeah. any sense. Only only to feel exactly the same way about yourself that you did before, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that does seem – that does seem – yeah, and that's three months of every year that you're going to put the whole family on ham and stuff. That, that does seem very – but I don't think it's like that. I think it's – I feel like maybe there are. There are definitely some people I know who, you know, or we've seen in the show at least that have a lot of plastic surgeries that are like, no, I want this and then I want this. And I, want, I have my whole big litany of things that I already know I want and I can only do one at a time, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas I feel like Lauren is more like, no, it's, I'm always going to be one thing away. The next thing is yeah. going to be the things that fix it, fixes it, right? And right. so, she doesn't think – she's not thinking I'm going to do this every year for five years or every year for 10 years. She's just like, I just need one more. One more will fix it. Honestly, I can't really tell the difference. I can't I mean, either at all. At all. She looks exactly the same to me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, good for the doctor for making it look so natural. Um, mm-hmm. But I think maybe a little bit out of her neck but that's like all i could even like kind of tell yeah that does seem like a lot of money to look not at all different (laughs) right not like drastically different yeah yeah okay uh let's move on to an ending of some sorts and that's with rob and sophie jeez yeah so we see sophie twerking at the club and ordering a triple tequila pineapple Sophie thinks it's weird that Rob's traveled somewhere else without her 
because it's the first time since she's been in the U.S. And she knows they're in a very weird place, but she hopes that he stays faithful. Sophie doesn't want to appear controlling, so that's why she hasn't reached out to Rob. She's a little worried because... She explains it. He used to smash and dip when he was in Kansas City and just didn't really care about women's feelings. Sophie does have trust issues, but she's trying not to think about what Rob is doing. Sophie doesn't regret moving out, but she hopes that moving out doesn't make things worse for them. Kay hates Rob and wants Rob out of the picture. She hasn't said as much to Sophie, but she thinks that Sophie is her soulmate and she would marry her if that's what it would take for her not to leave. Meanwhile, back in Kansas City, Julia, the bottle service girl, follows Rob outside and asks him if she can get his number. Rob tells her that he's going back inside because they have a bottle left, so he'll be back in there, so don't worry, he's not leaving. She kind of hangs on his neck and kisses his cheek a few times. Rob says that he hasn't had sex in a long time, and he doesn't know what to do. His friend, Chijuan, Tiwan, Tiwan, Tiwan tells yeah. him... Yeah, tells him to just do him. Sophie then calls Rob and wishes him a happy birthday. He keeps it short and says he'll talk to her later. She does sneak in a I love you at the end of the conversation and Rob says it back. Sophie doesn't want to end the marriage in under a year because she sees it as a failure. She claims no one could love him like she does because no one knows him like she does. He just, you know, pisses her off. Rob feels like her saying she loves him is kind of feeling manipulative. He feels confused and strung along. A few days later, Rob is back from Kansas City and he hasn't heard from Sophie. So Rob is frustrated because he thought it meant something for Sophie to tell him that she loved him, but doesn't feel like anything has changed. He thinks he's done everything that he could in this marriage. He just wants to function and be in a place where they can try to make it work. They can't seem to figure each other out, and Rob just thinks that they shouldn't be together. He texts Sophie, telling her he's going to show up at Kay's, and if she has any respect, that she'll come out and have a conversation. Rob has never had to let go of someone he cares about so much. Rob is upset and crying in the interview, kind of staring at his phone, waiting for an answer. An hour later, Rob drives over to Kay's, but he doesn't remember exactly which apartment is hers, so he calls Sophie to ask, and she immediately yells at him for sounding pissed at her. He is going in this to break up with her, and he thinks that it's scary. Rob is making the decision for both of them, since Sophie doesn't seem to want to rip off the Band-Aid. Rob then, you know, she finally comes out and reads something he wrote for her. He says that he's ending things with her, and she tries to object, but he asks her to just let him finish. He finishes reading what he wrote, like the reasons why for his mental uh, health. And, you know, she, you know, isn't hasn't been living with him. And she gets up and walks inside. Rob knocks on the door and Kay comes out telling him that she heard his stupid speech and that he needs to leave. Rob says that he will leave, but this is not her business. And as much as she thinks she's part of their relationship, it's really between Sophie and Rob. Kay tells him that he's blaming Sophie for the breakup when it's him and she is just sick of him. Rob leaves and Kay keeps yelling things behind him. Kay can't even believe that Rob is breaking up with Sophie after all Sophie has endured. Rob gets back to his car and then he goes back. Uh, to Kay's to finish yelling at Kay, saying that he does care about Sophie, but Kay is just not helping any of this situation. Rob vents that Kay is drama and everyone seems pissed at him. She should have stayed in her lane. And if Sophie had nothing to say to him, let that just be the case. And Kay shouldn't have said had anything to add. Rob doesn't think there's anything he can do to not piss someone off over there. All right. So what do you think about Kay? Do you think Kay is low key trying to like sabotage this relationship to be with Sophie? Or do you really think that she's just like really good friends and she's really doing this because this is what's best for Sophie kind of sticking up for her? Um, I think it's I mean, obviously, St- get, so getting Sophie out of this relationship is what's best for Sophie because um, mm-hmm. it's also what's best for Rob. This relationship shouldn't exist. It's terrible. Yeah. But yeah. 
I definitely think she's trying to, she's friend zoning here. Like she's definitely trying to yeah. hang out in the friend zone and like when they break up, oh, when they break up, I'll be right there. Like I do, yeah. I do think she's into Sophie too. And so I don't think those yeah. things are necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, especially that whole talk about like soulmates and stuff like that and like things is like, right. you, don't, you don't say that about your friends. <laughs> right. Well, okay. Yeah. You don't say, oh, I just marry her just so she would like be in my life. It's like, mm, okay. Mm, yeah. That's what, that's Seems something a little extreme. That, that's something that guys who are weird, the weird incels that are friend, like get caught in the friend zone is like, maybe we could just get married and do it. Like that's a, that's, that's what that is. That's like some girl <laughs> yeah. you were try way too into. And like, well, she rejected me outright. So I'll just sit here and be her friend until she decides it was right. Like that's the, that, that, that's the dynamic that it reminds me of. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it was like that. But. Yeah, this whole thing was just like, I also was concerned, like, I feel like that damn woman at the club who was just like hanging all over Rob. Oh, Julia. It was like, yeah. Oh, my God. She was like, because the more she did it, I was just like, the more I would think like, maybe it's wrong, but if, if a woman was that obsessed with me and I like aggressively trying to get my number, that aggressively trying to do it, I'd be like... I think this woman has an STI. Like, I would be very, very, like, very concerned <laughs> well, about that. I just feel like this is a production plant. And the reason Even why. Even a production plant I mean, or a, a fame thirsty person who just wants to be on camera right. and wants to weasel her way into Rob so she can maybe be on the show next time. Yeah, I, I, I can see yeah, that. Yeah, maybe. But what I was confused about is. Bottle service girls, she seemed really drunk. Yes, she right? did. And I feel yes, like she did. And I feel like she was definitely playing into that. Like, so it's like deniability at the end of the day, right? Like, oh, I was just really drunk. That's why I was like coming on to him shamelessly and maybe why I'd have been rejected, you know? But it's like, I don't know. I get that you're a bottle service girl, but you're still on the job. Like, I get that you can take kind of like a shot with the clients, but it's like, I, I don't think being wasted is a very effective thing for this job position. It just didn't seem real. No, bottle girls and bartenders are kind of the same, you know, same realm of thing. And you don't yeah. want them drunk because you know what drunk bottle girls and drunk bartenders do? They give away drinks. Give away. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which is why so the, I, the clients want them drunk. But yes, in like if you're the owner, I don't want them drunk at all. Yeah, so it just seemed fake to me. Like, she can't be that drunk. Like, she's on the job. Yeah, I mean, it it, it wasn't as fake as that one time they – remember that one time they went to the, the sex shop and they had the girl, like, proposition oh, yeah. them for a three-way? It's oh, like, no, God, that was yeah. the worst. That was the most fake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but at the end of the day, this is just one of those things that was like, Rob made the right decision. And it, and yeah, as much of a jerk. Let's not let's not think we're team Rob here. Rob's an asshole. Rob's a jerk. We don't yeah. like Rob, right? But even if we did like Rob, right? Whatever, like or not like Rob, if your wife isn't living with you and has no intention on actually staying and coming back, that relationship's over and you need to end it. Like, yeah, she's not. Yeah, and he was right. That was the right decision for both of them. Right, and. Like, they were just really salty. She was really salty because Sophie thought she had the upper hand and it was her decision and he was supposed to be doing all these things to win her back. And instead, he said, you know what? This isn't working. We're done. And she's like, how dare you break up with me? I'm the one that was supposed to be, you know, you know, knelt down and begged to get back and you just broke up with me. Like, and and that's 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 where all that's where all this came from. It's not about, like, whether they actually should or shouldn't break up. It was about like, how dare you be the one to break up? You're the asshole. You shouldn't be the you should be the one that got dumped. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. And I mean, I'm surprised that Rob took this long to do this because, right. you know, it was pretty obvious she wasn't moving back. Like even this season, we saw her three times coming back for like a day, if that, if that and then yeah. immediately leaving. But we, I mean, the last time we saw her come back, she literally just came back for an hour to say that she wasn't coming back. And right. it's like, well, then what are yeah, you doing we need to here? work on things. Well, what? Why? We'll work on what? You don't talk to me. What are we working yeah. on? Like, does it make any sense? And she was just waiting for like a big, I don't know, waiting for him to put together a parade in her honor or something. Like, she just has a weird kind of idea of what romance and love and marriage is. And it is always 
him constantly trying to woo me the entire time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of other people who hopefully will break up soon and Jasmine and Gina. Yeah. So it, it is time for the costume part of the pageant, which we – in the first episode. And for Panama, Jasmine is just in a blue – it looks like a peacock colored thing. There's feathers and everywhere, which somehow is the ocean um, because Panama has ocean on both sides of it. Um, it really okay. pales in comparison to the giant eagle head lady from the USA who has like oh a Oh, my huge gosh. I can't even wound. imagine holding that up. Yeah, it was huge. And anyway, so as she explains, she's supposed to be the ocean. And th- things been between her and Gino have been tense, but she's trying to focus on this pageant rather than their fight. So Gino is there despite being disinvited from the practices or whatever rehearsals last week. And we some, see some of the costumes in a montage before Jasmine comes out, including giant eagle lady who we see as Dallas. Like they even interview her like, what is up with this eagle? And she's like, well, isn't it amazing? So Jasmine comes out. She has way fewer props than anybody else. Just like a little Panamanian flag that she waves around with her plastic smile. She yeah. seems a little lost out there about what she's supposed to be doing with her hands at the time. She's just kind of like wave, <laughs> yeah. waving this little flag. And uh, so Gino is upset about being disinvited to the rehearsals, but doesn't want to go home and make things even worse. So he says he he says he's here just to support her, even if she's stiff and has bad posture. He's gonna bite his tongue about what he thinks. <laughs> So after the parade of costumes, it's time for the interview portion of the competition. We see a couple of interviews. We see Miss Columbia, you know, says uh, before her and talk about how so much she loves animals and Miss Monaco, how she runs a nonprofit. Then it's Jasmine's turn. The judges ask her what inspired her to do the pageant. And she says she was struggling with her identity when she moved to the U.S. And then gives a shout out to her mother. So it wasn't really a total disaster. So anyway, she is still mad at Gino because as nice of a woman as it was, all she can hear, like all she can have going through her head while this competition is going on is, you suck. You suck. Ah, why didn't you smile good enough? You should have walked straighter. So after that part of the competition, they go back to the hotel room where it really feels good for Jasmine to get off her feet. A common montage of this whole beauty pageant thing is I guess there's a lot of standing in heels and so she always wants to sit down. (laughs) They're sitting in separate beds and Gino is pretty sure that she's going to lose because – She's not listening to him. If she listened to him, she would win. So she asked how she thinks she did, how he thinks she did, she did today. And he tries to be positive and say, you were better. So she tells him that she was Uh. off her game because of a fighting they've been doing. And you need to clear the air moving forward to this, um, clear the air. Gino thinks she means evidently means, you know, it's time to get really defensive right now. So just let's just start with that. So she starts talking about – he just automatically starts talking clearly about what? I've done nothing wrong. I didn't say anything. I didn't say you were ugly. So Jasmine tells him that it's not just you know this but long-term things that make her feel ugly all the time. Gino is disappointed by her saying this, not because he feels bad for making her feel that way but because he thought he was owed the apology. What do you mean you want me to apologize to you? How dare you? How dare you? I never get credit for anything. Um, for all the things he said when he was trying to support her like that. He wants credit. She doesn't really – It. she seems like she doesn't really understand like what was – what – he doesn't understand what he has said that he's supposed to be apologizing for or both. Both – neither of them do. Like what did I say that – it was her too, right? He was like, well, what about the things you said to me? And she's like, what things? What are you talking about? <laughs> And then we go to the well-worn ground about how he doesn't put out enough. So he wants more credit for setting this whole pageant thing up. And, you know, and she's like, the only reason we had to set up this pageant is because I'm looking for the vindi- the, the um, v- a validation that I'm not getting from you because you won't sleep with me. <laughs> like, um, you, you make me feel like I'm not attractive. So she literally is just desperate for his attention and she starts crying and explaining that, you know, that's what's going on here. So in interviews, she says that he has other preferences when it comes to sex and is kind of making her believe that that is all her fault. So he counters with essentially, well, this is your fault because you're always yelling at me and that makes you get uglier by the day. Oh, God. So, um, yeah. So that's what they should be working on, like her yelling at him. That's the only thing that matters. You know, the sex stuff is secondary. So she says that if he feels that way, he should have never married her. And she says if they're not going to be intimate, that she's not going to stay married to him. So he tells her that um, she isn't really seeing the root cause of his problem. And if she can't see that, then they're doomed. 
Um, and I guess the root cause was evidently something she needs, to, whatever. She's the root cause, not him being the root <laughs> cause. So in the second episode, Jasmine is very excited for her competition to almost be over. There's only the nightgown competition left and what she, she says she really wants to win this thing. So we see a supercut of all the contestants on the nightgown thing. And we also see Jasmine backstage where she immediately takes off her shoes and they bring the contestants out to give out the awards. And while this particular competition does have one big winner, Miss International World, um, they also give out a huge number of other awards. And it seems like yeah. it seems like more people won awards than didn't win awards. Right. So, it definitely felt that way. A lot of participation crowns out there. Yeah, a lot of participation crowns out there. And Jasmine was one of the participation crowns, which was Miss Latina International, right? Which I'm pretty sure she was the only latina in the company oh, like we saw miss columbia so we did columbia, have, have yeah. at least one other one so she says that she's disappointed she didn't win the big one but she's happy with any crown anyway because this whole thing was about self-competence so anyway after the competition the girls are congratulating each other and taking pictures and there's like a whole backdrop picture thing and jasmine is just ignoring gino like he tries to take a picture with her and just stands awkwardly next to her and she doesn't do anything like didn't even look at him He's shocked that he's getting the cold shoulder because she wouldn't have been able to get her award without his advice. So where's his appreciation? Oh where's my credit? So eventually backstage, Jasmine has to get off her feet again. So she sits down and starts laying into Gino. So things like, I wanted to appreciate this moment and I can't even because we had this huge fight yesterday. So her solution to that is to start the fight over again. Uh, she was pretty upset that things were going bad and all the, about all the criticism. Now that she's won something and now, you know, but now that she finally won something, now it's all like, oh, look, great. Didn't we do a fantastic thing? It's like, eh, you were criticizing me before. So she says that and he's like, well, I don't like your fucking attitude right now. <laughs> oh, God. Like, um, that he's because he's been supporting her and he never gets credit for any of the support. Like supporting her and filling out all the paperwork um, to get her free from Panama and, uh, you know, filling out the paperwork that I'm doing right now to get your green card. And that's when she – the conversation takes a turn because she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The paperwork you're filling out now for my green card? I thought you sent that in three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> what are oh you talking about? Oh, my gosh. So she ignores most of his provocation and just goes to like, whoa, 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 I need a yes or no question. Did you submit the paperwork for my green card? Yes or no. And then, Jay, you know, Gino, we leave things with Gino making his Gino face. Oh, um, God. So I guess we go to that. What, in your opinion, because Gino wants to get to the root cause of their problems, is the root cause of their problems that needs to be addressed before the sex stuff can be addressed? Him. It's him. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he is a lazy, lazy man. You yeah. know, it's like you are not working. Why did you not fill out this paperwork immediately? You knew that's what she wanted. And it's just like it shocks me that he just has like such a lack of of empathy for the fact that she wants to go back see her ailing mother and her right. kids and it's like yeah, yeah it's, it's like oh it's only been three weeks it's like that's three weeks sooner she could have seen the, her kids yeah. you know that's yeah, a big deal in her world when we even saw this going back to the um ah, the last tell all they were on like somebody had mm -hmm. a green card and she was like the hell he's got his green card already i've been here forever i've yeah. my green card and they were like oh yeah because he was like waiting outside the door the first day he could possibly turn it in for right. the immigration office to open and i was like yeah. had it all done had it all ready to go and it's like yeah three weeks is a long time like it's another month yeah so i just don't understand why he is doing that and it just to me it's like you have no other excuses what other things do you have in your life other than fantasy football that could possibly be taking you away from that and so it just it really makes me believe her when she's just like it's his way of controlling me it, yeah, sure it definitely seems like that and it's also he's the most exhausting type of person and it tends to be a mm -hmm. man, men more than women that you see this in but just like why aren't you giving me credit that want like right I want credit. Why am I getting credit? I need the credit. You're not giving me any credit. But it's just like – like he's the kind of guy that like does the dishes and then wants you to be like, oh, I see you did the dishes. Thank you for doing that. Instead of being like, no, like the dishes are done. I appreciate that the dishes are done. I like that I don't have to do them. But I'm not going to throw a fucking parade because you did the goddamn dishes, right? Right. And especially if it's something that you claimed as your own, I will take care of this for you. 
and then you slow walk it. No, you don't get credit for doing it. Like it's just yeah. that's what you said you would do. But it's part of the agreement of being in a partnership. It's not we don't throw, you know, big parties for each other for doing what we said we would do to make this relationship work. That's that's exhausting to have to do that all the time. Yeah, but it does kind of make you wonder a little bit, is it a control thing? Does he not want her to leave? Because I kind of it does come off that way. It's like, why else would you prolong these things? But you are afraid that if she were to leave to go visit, that she may never come back. I, I he absolutely is afraid of that. He is also I think he's also afraid after he got rejected from these things and he wanted to go home. He's like, if I go back to Miami without her, she's never leaving Miami. She's not coming yeah. back with me. Right. Right. And I could see that, too. Like, oh, she doesn't need anything more from me. Mm-hmm. Like, so she's out. So no, it's, yeah, I don't get that. No, he's I mean, he's the worst. He's he he, he definitely thinks that um, whatever. I, I, maybe he, she's not good enough or she's too good for him. But he has a way of making her feel shitty to keep her around and doing yeah. shitty things to her to keep her around like and it's because he's like if she gets too comfortable she'll realize i'm shitty and leave or something so he has to keep her uncomfortable mm-hmm. and that's yeah however however uncomfortable looks if it looks like criticizing her in the pageant if it looks like you know not being intimate with her if it looks like not filling out the green card it's all ways to keep her uncomfortable right oh god he's the worst yeah Speaking of, uh, out of the group that you saw, uh, who would you say is your student of the week? Um, uh, I, I, I wanted to give it to Rob because he made the right decision, but then he came back and fought with, with Kay. And I was like, that was a bad decision. That was unnecessary. We don't need any of that. So I will, um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give it to Patrick for finally like powering through and doing the, the asking that he should have done just like immediately. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually gave it to Alexi. Um, okay. and I get it because at the beginning it was like, Argh! you know, but for someone who, uh, you know, has very strong ideas of gender roles and, mm-hmm. um, you know, feels that those gender roles were affirmed by their partner, um, and certainly did not you know, feel uh, or express the most positive feelings about kind of flipping the script on those gender roles and kind of, you know, not having the best reaction. The fact that he was able to recognize that, okay, you know, that was not the best reaction. I need to walk it back. Um, I need to be more supportive. Um, You know, we can have a conversation and he came around fairly quickly. Right. It was the next uh, day. Would, it was literally the next day. Right. Yeah. Right. I'll give it to Alexi because that is more than we see on this show. Right. That's true. Yeah. When people, you know, don't behave or react the best way. So. Right. Alexi for turning it around. Okay. What about All your right. nuts? Uh, I, I'm going to say Gino. Just he was awful this whole time. Like even that one, well, I promised I wouldn't criticize her. Even if she's doing yeah. a shitty job and not smiling and not standing up straight and not waving right. Like what and and yeah, just turning everything into and you you know he's wrong. He's you always know he's wrong when he gets defensive, right? And, and yeah. as, as soon as she was like, We need to talk about stuff, he was like, We don't have to talk about anything. I did nothing wrong. And it's like any pretty much anybody, very, very few tells about whether you did something wrong or not than adamantly saying i did nothing wrong like it almost makes me guarantee you definitely did something wrong yeah yeah i actually went with sophie on this one okay. um, all right because yeah. yeah i know mixing it up we usually have the usual suspects for our dunce but no yeah I just, for sure i had problems with so many things that she did here like you know, the whole thing that she was saying at the beginning about like, oh, we're not living together, but um, I hope that doesn't affect our relationship. It's other, like, yeah, one of the, oh, I don't know why right. he went to a whole other city. It's like, because you're not there. Why would he stick around right. and sit around the house waiting for you? That, does, that doesn't yeah, make any sense. It's, it makes total sense he'd go back to Kansas City for sure. Right. But then also like not seeing and kind of enabling Kay to be so bold to Mm -hmm. confront Rob and really she is allowing Kay to interfere in their relationship and it's just not right like she needs to go 
you know, like, I think what it would have been better is, you know, like, and Rob had kind of said as much, you know, when she left him, not go to K's, go somewhere else mm-hmm. where she can actually think by herself. But she's like going to K's house, having fun with K, not thinking about anything. So yeah. they aren't going to resolve anything because she isn't taking time to think about her situation and deciding what she uh, wants. Yeah. No, she's just right. going yeah. and dis- distracting herself. Yes, she's going and having a good time. And then when it comes to, I don't want to think about that yet. And then coming back to him every three months saying, I just really need time to think about it. And it's like, what have yeah. you been doing the past three months if not exactly. thinking about it? Right, yeah. right. So, and then just her reaction when he called to like, just get like the apartment number. Like she's got to know that yeah. this is yeah, a you- serious conversation. It's like, why do you sound so pissed off? Yeah, and he, I mean, he kind of, he sounded like dejected. He was like, hey. Yes, and she was like, did. oh my God, you already sound pissed at me. And it's like, well, okay, we well, right. started fighting immediately. Great, thank you. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, like <sighs> life lessons. My life lesson goes kind of to them too, is like, <sighs> there's not really a winner and a loser in every break in breakups, right? Mm-hmm. If it's a breakup that needed to happen and it was for the best, then it can be for the best. You can't be, you should not yeah, basically, if you were upset that you were not the one that got to dump the other person, <laughs> then you definitely yeah, right. needed broken up. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, my life lesson is for Angela. You should uh, never be making major decisions in your life or doing things that have big consequences simply to tell someone you told them so <laughs> out of sp- literally just spite <laughs> yes just out of spite like that just why are you ruining your life just to like say i told you so to someone that makes no sense yeah for sure yeah all right so uh we will be back again with this group next week yep. that's right okay we will. so until then all right see everybody then all right okay bye bye, bye.